today we're going to consider the origin of flight. You know, how in the world did flight evolve from a crater that it was non-flying? There are two broad classes of hypotheses uh, that have persisted now for over uh, 150 years. And those two classes are that the ancestor to birds was either a tree dweller or a ground dweller, a runner on the ground or somebody hopping around in the trees. And from there, from those two life modes, uh, flight evolved. Now, the earliest hypothesis, Williston, 1879, in Nopska, around the turn of the century, is a cursorial runner hypothesis. And here, the ancestor to birds is thought to be a highly cursorial critter, you know, running around like Velociraptor or something. Um, and it gets slightly elongated feathers, right, on its four wings and begins beating those as it's running, increases the forward velocity as it's trying to either capture prey or get away from predators or whatever it's doing when it's running fast. Um, and further elongation of feathers gives even greater forward speed and pretty soon it's basically flying anyway, so it's airborne. And there's the evolution of flight through those kinds of steps. Um, the arboreal camp basically says, no, 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 no. The ancestor to birds is probably the basal uh, reptile, some basal group, you know, and, and they're living in the trees, they're highly arboreal, and they're probably move in small steps from uh, uh, branch to branch leapers, then tree to tree gliders, and, and then you go from gliding to true powered flight. And this logic is nice for most people. It's easy for most people to imagine a sequence of steps. Um, so what we need to do then is play the game of science. So how do we decide between a couple of hypotheses? Once we have alternative ex explanations for something, we got to then generate predictions that necessarily follow from each, right? So let's consider the cursorial runner hypothesis. What sort of predictions necessarily follow from this hypothesis? Uh, before we get into predictions, let me state one assumption that's hardly ever stated. And that is, most people look at the characteristics of Archaeopteryx and assume that Archaeopteryx, or someone just like Archaeopteryx, was on the path toward uh, true flight and toward birds. If it's off on a dead end somewhere else, well then, why are we looking at all these characteristics of Archaeopteryx that didn't lead to birds anyway? Anyway, that's one assumption. You have to keep that in mind. So. Assuming, then, that Archaeopteryx is the ancestor of modern birds or something like Archaeopteryx, here's the kind of predictions authors suggest. Um, it should be a highly cursorial animal. It's a runner. Come on. So you should be able to look at adaptations in the feet and the hind limbs and the pelvis. And, and when people do that, the uh, anatomical structure says, yep, that is indeed the case, and that's supported. That prediction seems to hold up. The second prediction, though, is that incipient wings, you know, half wings, should help increase running speed. But here we run into problems. Uh, Jeremy Rayner in 1980 published a paper doing all the physics saying there's no way. Uh, he says when you get to step C there in the middle and you begin lifting your feet off the surface, uh, you'll lose 30 to 40 percent of your running speed at that step. You're not going to gain forward momentum at all. Um, in a more recent publication, Burgers and Chiapi, they said, yeah, you know, they did calculations, said Archaeopteryx looks as if it might have increased forward speed running with the, its particular anatomical setup, but probably not uh, if it had only half wings. So we still have a problem here of finding support for the hypothesis in terms of it really increasing forward running speed. The arboreal hypothesis, what sort of predictions follow here? Well. The ancestor should have shown adaptations for living in a tree, in, you know, the arboreal environment, like reversed hallux, you know, backward-facing hallux, climbing claws, things like that. Okay, and indeed, you look, uh, and these proposed ancestors do have reversed hallux. But here's the weakness in the game of science. There's no hypothesis, basically, that doesn't predict the same thing. A reversed hallux is present in all Solurosaurian theropod dinosaurs. Everything running around out there has reversed hallux. So that doesn't necessarily mean they live in trees. It's not a character that's limited to arboreal critters. So here's a game where people are saying, see, I have support, but 
that same prediction occurs with every other hypothesis, so you haven't dumped anything. Now, Fiducia, who's a real proponent of this hypothesis in modern times, uh, started looking at the details of claws uh, in Archaeopteryx and says, oh my gosh, look at this. The curvature suggests that Archaeopteryx had to be an arboreal critter. So you measure the arc and, and, and lengths of claws of all kinds of birds of the world. He plots them on a graph and notice that ground-dwelling birds tend to have uh, not have flat, not so uh, curved uh, claws, whereas the perchers, those that perch in trees, most birds basically have intermediate, and those that climb around in trees all the time have very curved claws. And so he says, see, look at this, this is amazing. But once again, uh, the hallux of Archaeopteryx is not that much different from present-day ground-dwelling pheasants, the low tubercle and straight claws. So the question is, how did he classify the behavior of all these species on the graph? Who is it that says they're a ground dweller or a percher or a climber? Did he have a stopwatch and do the proportion of time in each of those things? In other words, some of the ones he puts in perchers there with Archaeopteryx could actually be, have been classified as ground dwellers. And so people who are skeptical that this is a definitive kind of evidence. Sure, it's consistent with the idea they're arboreal, but it's not inconsistent with the idea that they're on the ground still. Now, Perhaps the most inconvenient truth for the arboreal hypothesis supporters is that Archaeopteryx was a runner. And, and so uh, the pelvic girdle structure suggests that Archaeopteryx was clearly a runner. That seems inconsistent with an arboreal life. If birds had arboreal ancestors, they wouldn't have developed running adaptations, right? So even if the ancestral form were highly cursorial runner, a non-flyer that subsequently developed flight, and how could such an obligate biped invade the arboreal zone and retain its bipedality unless the forelimbs hadn't already become adapted for flight? So anyway, it's hard to see how you have a runner in a tree. Well, more recently, Karokchin and Bogdanovich came along and said, oh, well, you guys are wrong. It, 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 it isn't a runner. It's a jumper. And if you look at the pelvic girdle structure, you'll see that what it did was jump from branch to branch to branch. That's why it looks like a bipedal uh, runner, but it's not. It's actually a jumper. Anyway, uh, others that have done anatomical analyses say that, oh, come on, give me a break. Um, it's not a jumper. It's a runner. And so you get into arguments having to know the details of anatomy to argue whether it's a runner or not. And my impression is 99% of the anatomists say no, it's a runner. The functional morphologists say this is a pelvic girdle set for running, not jumping. Here's another prediction Fiducia comes up with. If flight came from gliding, then Archaeopteryx shouldn't have been a powerful flyer. It should have been kind of intermediate. And indeed, he says there's evidence that Archaeopteryx was a weak flyer. He says, look, look, it has asymmetrical veins, which indicates, you know, some kind of powered flight, but yet the flight must have been very weak because there's not a well-developed carina, right? And so if you don't have a carina for the attachment of the supracoracoideus and the pectoralis, especially supracoracoideus, the upstroke is going to be really weak. And so for modern-day birds, you can actually cut that tendon. Birds can still fly, but not from the ground up. Only if you put them on a perch and let them take off, then they can take off with this weakly powered flight. He says, see, it must have been in the trees. It's a weak flight. Well, the weakness of this argument is, once again, to conclude weak flight must originate from trees represents a non sequitur of the worst kind. It's difficult to see how their conclusion that flight originated in trees follows directly from the fact that Archaeopteryx was a weak flyer. Any alternative hypothesis would be consistent with that fact. Weak flight supports one no more than any other hypothesis, because any hypothesis has to show some selective advantage in having a half wing or weak flight. Another inconvenient prediction that seems to follow necessarily from the arboreal hypothesis is that all four limbs should have been involved in gliding or flight, um, because every glider in the world uh, involves all four limbs, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, gliding uh, frogs, or you're talking about gliding squirrels, you're talking about gliding 
anything, you know, anything, just think about it. Who glides in the world? And they involve all four limbs, not just two. So have, having two limbs with flight feathers seems pretty weird if it came from gliding. Nonetheless, this is the classic view you see in textbooks. Not only is this story problematic because it's hard to imagine a glider not involving all four limbs, but because we have a cursorial biped in the trees. That's still a problem. So I don't know how you go from, from arboreal life to leaping between trees, to parachuting, to gliding, to active flight. This is still going to be a problem. Well, in the game of science, sure enough, somebody comes along with an alternative explanation. But generally, they've always stayed in these two camps. It's going to be one or the other, a ground dweller, runner, or a tree dweller. And along comes John Ostrom. This is the same guy that suggested birds evolve from dinosaurs, right? He comes up with the cursorial fly swatter hypothesis. And here, birds are thought to use their weakly developed wings for not powered flight, but for slapping insects in front of them, right? They're insect nets. Um, so he predicts, oh, they should be runners. Yeah, everything's consistent with that. They should have been a weak flyer. Yeah, everything's consistent with that, but what isn't? Um, and then uh, the problem with his, and the reason it lasted maybe 10 minutes after it was published, was that uh, an insect net is not designed to do the same thing that wings are, <laughs> increasing interaction with the air. In fact, you want to minimize interaction with the air. Have you ever seen a fly swatter? It has holes in it. So that didn't last too long. But it didn't take long for yet another hypothesis to come along. And this is a cursorial jumping flycatcher hypothesis of Capel and others. So here, a chemist and a biologist and a physicist from Northern Arizona University published this idea. And the evolutionary process here is thought to have begun with an active bipedal insectivore, right, that jumped for flying insects and captured those insects in its mouth. So what's cool is if you, when you're jumping in the air, you reach out with your arms and any little extension of scales you could imagine would help increase control in the air. So control of the pitch, right, the yaw and the roll axes during a jump. And so you become more accurate at catching insects, do better than others, leave more offspring, and on and on and on and on. And therefore, elongation of scales to help um, maneuver in the air as you're catching insects. Now, the problem, uh, well, let me just say, uh, I haven't seen anyone publish anything showing data inconsistent with this idea. It just hasn't been... Um, captured people's imagination enough, I guess. And so, uh, as far as I know, it's never been dumped, but people aren't jumping on that bandwagon. I'd have to ask uh, folks here in the flight lab what might be inconsistent with that hypothesis. But for now, at least, it seems like a viable one. Then, there's something new again that comes along. Unbelievable. Here, after 150 years, we begin to see people thinking of new things. And this next one is not really an arboreal or cursorial. It's someone that operates in both environments. And Ken Dial comes up with the idea of it, the evolution of flight being the result of wing-assisted incline running. Here, he says, wings are used to generate lift or force, downward force, pinning the organism against a surface that it's climbing, usually it's an inclined surface like a tree or, you know, rocks and things like that to get away from predators. So this is amazing to have come up with a completely different idea like this. And he published this in Science and then went on to show uh, amazingly and measure the amount of downward force that even half wings produce. Even one day old chicks can do this. Take a look at this video here. Here's a one day old chucker, I think, uh, crawling up this 45 degree or 50 or 60 degree slope. And it's beating its wings. And it has, they can actually measure tiny, tiny, tiny little bits of force that these wings can produce. Certainly by five days old, no question. It's pinning itself against the surface, using its claws, so it's a runner. It's using its feet, it's a runner, but it's using its wings to assist the running. 
and it's going up, up, 60, 70 degree slopes, 80 degree slopes, 15 days, no problem. Look at these birds. Here's an adult just walking, basically, right up these inclines, using the wings to pin themselves, a nearly 90 degree slope here. So that is the magic that happened in the flight lab. When Ken Dial first showed me this, he flipped the video sideways and didn't tell me, and here's what he showed me. He said, look, look, here go, watch. It's a cursorial runner hypothesis. See, see, it's gaining speed, right, right? He says, ha, 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 it wasn't going horizontally, it was going vertically. And he said, this is the magic of this idea, it's vertical. So if you don't believe this is a really general phenomenon, some people say, oh, well, that's a weirdo thing that has to do with chuckers and nothing else. So here's a video clip from the flight lab to show the, the diversity of bird types involved in this wing-assisted incline running. So Ken was trying to point out that this is not a fluke of some you know, one particular kind of bird, some grouse or something that does this, but it's, it's broad throughout the entire range of orders of birds. So take a look at this. Here we go. Starting down at the very bottom, Tinamiformes. Here's a crested tinamou. Oh, here's a galliform, brush turkey. Look at that, way over, over 90 degrees. Chucker coming in, another galliform, right? Then here comes an apodiform, a great dusky swift, an apodiform. Look at that thing using its wing climbing the wall. Unbelievable. Oh, there's our pigeon. Now we're in the columbiforms, right? Totally different order of birds. Here's a shearwater, a seabird coming in from the ocean, climbing up trees to get to its nest, right? It can barely walk. It's using its wings to get up this vertical incline. Procellariforms. Oh, here's an owl in the strigiforms. Owls climbing straight up trees. And here's a magpie, a passerin, so in the passeriformes. And martins in the passeriforms. All these things. And here's a thrush, a passerin. So I hope you appreciate what this series uh, shows. It shows that birds of all kinds use their wings in order to generate a downward lift, downward force to pin themselves against a surface, a steep vertical surface, so that they're able to negotiate that. What's amazing here is that, uh, this is a cool graph, it shows that uh, when birds are approaching as adults uh, inclines less than 45 degrees, they tend to use their legs only. They'll just walk right up. As soon as you get beyond 45 degrees or so, they're going to begin incorporating wings into the action. They're going to recruit those wings to help pin them against the surface. And here's the, the data for adults. And as you go outward from, from zero here, you're getting older and older. This is age and days, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, 40 days by 40 days. It can go straight up 90 degrees. By 50 days, it can go 105 degrees in an overhang, basically, pinning itself against that overhang. Um, and then if you do experimental manipulations, have that control bird, there it is, the same, same data that I showed you on the left. Then you have a trimmed bird there you've trimmed some of the uh, primary feathers right you clip them and then here you pluck all the, the flight feathers from the wing and see how the bird does and on a coarse substrate like sandpaper if you pluck it it can't go nearly as steep as you can with a trimmed which is intermediate to the manip unmanipulated control bird so half wings do a lot to, to help pin the organism half feather could be seen uh, in terms of natural selection and then the selective advantage of having a half wing is very clear from these data. Well, about the same time Ken came out with his idea, Zhang Chu and others published this paper on four wing dinosaurs from China, it published in Nature, and uh, it caused quite a stir because, oh my gosh, look what we have now. We have a four-winged dinosaur, the perfect intermediate to powered flight, right? So the arboreal hypothesis seemed to be alive and well. There you go. So people complaining that, that gee, how do you have an arboreal hypothesis with only two wings involved? Well, there were four wings. See, we have fossil record of it now. And then uh, Zheng et al. just last year up the ante with yet another uh, example published in Science. You can see the feathers on the, on the forelimbs and the hind limbs. 
And so their idea is clearly that these, these organisms that were gliders probably were intermediate and on their way toward losing those feathers on the hind limbs subsequently and then that being the direct ancestor to birds. So they could imagine small steps through gliding to powered flight. How does Ken respond to this? He responds to it by saying, phooey. He says, there's no way. Flapping, not gliding, is a precursor to powered flight. He says, show me one glider in the world, anywhere, that moves its appendages at all when it's in the air. Show me one. They never flap. He says, gliding is not an intermediate step toward flying, period. Um, and he says, what's cool about the wing-assisted incline running is it's very clear. You can see all the intermediates as you, as you go from a young bird all the way up to the adult. Every step is intermediate. The selective advantages leading toward true flight are really clear. Not only that, he says, the wing stroke plane on a bird climbing up a vertical incline is very much like the wing stroke plane of, of powered flight in the air. You just flip the bird. 90 degrees and can see. So that so everything about this hypothesis, the wing-assisted incline running, uh, fits really well uh, in terms of a story of intermediate steps toward the evolution of flight. And so in Ken's view, sure, there were gliding dinosaurs. There are gliders out there today. That doesn't mean they led to powered flying machines. They're an offshoot somewhere, um, in, and they're not leading on directly on to the evolution of birds. So this is his view would be the evolution of, of feathers, wings, gliding would go in an offshoot, whereas powered flight is coming directly from this wing-assisted incline running story. Mm -hmm.